one of the problems that we face at the current level of usage is that uh, base load generating capacity in most of the eastern states is getting uh, a bit thin in terms of uh, its covering demand. Um, with these sort of price rises though, we might not need additional uh, generating capacity for a long time because it should slash the demand. Well, it's an interesting point. Most, most of the modelling that we've done has actually shown that there is uh, some reduction in demand as, as you start seeing the price rise. Now, I should say that the modelling we've done in the past had not taken into account what is now occurring on the network side. And so the network component of those increases is about 50% of what we're talking about. So we'd only been looking at the generation side here. Um, nonetheless, electricity use is relatively inelastic over, over quite a long period and you don't see quite the reductions you might expect. However, when we looked at um, sector by sector impacts, it's quite interesting to see where you do see uh, quite dramatic uh, impacts. Not surprisingly, one of them is in aluminium smelting and production, which is one of our largest customers. What surprised us was that we actually saw quite a significant reaction in the residential um, demand. And so small business wasn't quite so dramatically affected and you saw much of industry and commerce uh, was able to adjust over the period, it slight, slight decreases in demand. But it was certainly smelting. It was to an extent some of the minerals uh, processing and to an extent um, residentials. Whilst that does do that, um, let, if I just go back to your comment about uh, baseload power, one of the reasons that the hiatus in, in carbon policy has been able to be accommodated by our sector is that we still have sufficient baseload power hanging around to actually continue with good, reliable, competitively priced supply. Our view of it is that we're probably talking about the 2015-2016 period when we'll need a new baseload plant coming on stream. Now, that might feel a fair way away to most people, but when you've got to build these things, that's not far off at all. And, and you know, D-Day is fast approaching us. We've actually got to get this carbon policy uncertainty resolved in the next uh, 18 months to two years at the outside. And does that mean that it's got to be a tax? not an emissions trading scheme, given the complexities about having an emissions trading scheme and getting that going? Well, well look, I'm not sure that it, 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 the particular mechanism necessarily um, follows from the sort of time frame we're talking about. Uh, I think there are a, quite a range of, of ways you can go about this. Even a tax, uh, frankly, has many of the challenges that the uh, emissions trading scheme has. If I just because interestingly, any time you do economic modelling of the impacts of, of an emissions trading scheme, it's actually modelled as a tax. So the impacts uh, in the industry of a tax are very similar to an emissions trading scheme. So if I go back to our coal-fired generation sector again, uh, too aggressive a tax, just the same as too aggressive a, uh, an emissions trading scheme, winds up stranding assets and leaving debt and equity uh, without adequate recompense and therefore a whole series of questions around sovereign risk in Australia as a place for capital to be allocated. Which was the problem with the CPRS? From our perspective that was the, the key problem that we had and we got most of the way to solving that with the government but not all of the way. But isn't it possible that uh, with this committee that the government has now set up that they're not really going to start with a clean sheet of paper because it's too, that sort of is too hard. They don't have the resources, they don't have the time. So really what they're going to do is, I would have thought, take the CPRS and start looking at that, basic, basing their consideration on that. Well, I think undoubtedly the, the, the nation has uh, had a series of reviews that, that mean we understand pretty well what an emissions trading scheme that's cap and trade in nature would look like. But I also think that uh, academics like um, Warwick McKibben have done plenty of work and published plenty of work around a, a hybrid model. There are other examples in the world of, of markets uh, that are uh, environmental markets, if you like, that could be applied here. And I think, uh, especially drawing on the GST as an example, you can actually see how some of these taxes would work. A blank sheet of paper? Not exactly. But, but probably um, a piece of paper with few details on it, but a lot of knowledge of what does work and what doesn't work from a policy and probably a politics perspective. Um, 
it will be interesting to see how the committee works and of course we're looking forward to the roundtable processes that, that will complement that uh, for, for directly discussing with the government the various options they might well be looking at.